New York Times and Senior Fellow of the Pace Academy for Applied Environmental Studies. And let me just get you the mic. Thank you, Nira, and thanks for coming, everybody, and look forward. These presentations will end up online as well, so I'll thank future viewers. <laughs> um, there's so many important issues that are being explored here today, and uh, they all relate to durability, to, um, the, there's an overused word, resilience, which can often, in the old way, in the old, the old definition of the word was kind of bouncing back. And what's clear is, given trajectories to human development and for, in the case of climate change, for future climate, uh, we have to figure out how to bounce forward, not so much get back to the systems that we were comfortable with in the old days. Um, and that's what I think we're going to talk about today in the context of utilities and critical systems and communication as well. How do you get, keep a city like New York City illuminated and connected uh, after a calamitous event? And we saw clearly uh, nearly two years ago, it didn't work out very well. A big chunk of the city. There's a video on my blog that shows Lower Manhattan going dark like that. And, you, and then you, you heard the stories of people who couldn't get up, to the elderly people who couldn't get up and down in, in these buildings because the elevators weren't functioning. And obviously, if New York City and its uh, ilk around the world want to be, be maintain their, their, the thing that makes them so wonderful, their dynamics and their connectedness and their mobility and all those things are reliant on uh, electricity, largely. So how do you keep the lights on? How do you not have a repeat of what happened? And of course, as, as you heard this morning, the next disaster may not necessarily be the same type that we had a couple of years ago. So with that in mind, we're gonna talk to some people who are really dug in on different facets of this question and are invaluable um, perspectives. And we'll start with uh, the far end, um, Tom, uh, Troy, DeVries, uh, Troy DeVries, who's chief engineer for distribution engineering at Con Ed. And, and then we'll go to Tom Bourgeois, who is a colleague of mine at the Pace and Energy and Climate Center up in White Plains, and is also a director of the U.S. Department of Energy's Northeast Combined Heat and Power Technical Assistance Partnership. Then Chris Lavendos, Vice President of National Operations for Verizon. And again, Verizon both needs energy to make sure that we can stay connected, and uh, its own connectivity is a vital part of how we function in the 21st century. So if that goes down, there's a lot of not just frustration, but uh, hazard to people as well. And finally, uh, Osgam Ornektikin is the Deputy Commissioner for Energy Management at the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services. And we were just talking a minute ago, she's uh, originally from Turkey, a country that, uh, where Istanbul, one of the world's great cities, faces a different kind of inevitable disaster, earthquakes, uh, which I wrote about in 2009 on the front page of the New York Times. And, and, and they're trying in a city that was, had only a million people in, two, in 1950, and now has about 15 million people in the metropolitan area. They have to figure out with an inevitable earthquake hazard how to sort of build forward, how to not just bounce back. And so we're gonna stick to New York City today, but the idea and the, and the energy landscape is the same. So uh, Troy, if you could give us, I think you have a bit of a sort of a revisiting of what actually happened uh, back then, October, two years ago. If you could start with that, and then we'll get into this question of, what keeps everybody here up at night thinking about opportunities? Sure. And pull the microphone. Okay, first of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, I think there's supposed to be... Oh, geez, that's a big full silence or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, they'll call again. Sorry. I actually advocate for leaving your phones on. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was using it as a timer, actually, but uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the impacts on the electric distribution system. Um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, you see um, the lower Manhattan going dark. I mean, that's that's a pretty significant and, and uh, pretty significant event. I have a picture here that kind of brings that back in, into play, um, and I don't want to I don't want to point out just the electric system. When the electric system goes down, it impacts everybody. Uh, but there's, there's transit, uh, there's communication issues, there's logistic issues, food, fuel, we all struggled through these, myself included, there was no power in my house during any of these events. Um, so first I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a refresh on the Sandy impacts of the electric distribution system. 
Then I'm going to go through some of the measures, and I'll make this quick, some of the measures that Con Edison has been undertaking. And then I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction on microgrids, because I think today's discussion is about uh, distributed power resources. And that's probably a good uh, segue into the stuff that everybody else is talking about. So this uh, diagram that I'm showing here just shows you the, the, the photo shows you where the water, the floodwaters came into play. And uh, I want to draw your attention to the total number of customers out of the service there, 1.1 uh, million. And I'm going to quickly flip to the next slide just to show you how that ranks with other uh, storms on the electric system. Um, it's one of the top 10. It is the top 10, uh, the top out of the 10 uh, highest numbers of customers impacted. And that 1.1 customers is five times the next most significant event, which was Irene at 200,000. Um, another point I want to make out on this slide, if you look at, at the storms that are listed here, five out of this top 10 occurred during a three year period in 2010, 11, and 12. So there's definitely something to miss. Uh, this slide just shows you some of the photos. Uh, the top left corner there, you see a, a picture of the street in front of East 13th Street substation. Uh, there's about five feet of water there. Um, you've all seen the bottom left photo there. Uh, that's a view uh, of southern Manhattan, all in the dark. There are 13 networks. Uh, networks can be 50 to 100,000 customers. There's 13 networks out of service down there. That little beacon of light down there is the Battery Park Network. That stayed in lights because it was fed from a different substation. Um, the photo to the right just shows you the size and the scope of the, the storm. Um, it, it lasted a long time and, and it caused a lot of damage. Uh, here's a photo of some of the damage uh, from our radio systems in the, in the overhead areas, the non-network systems. Uh, poles down, when the trees come down they seem to take everything with them. Uh, we had 70% of our non-network customers were out of service. I think somebody mentioned earlier in, in the panel the uh, Battery Park underpass. So you see a photo here of that underwater. That's all had to be dewatered and cleaned up. This is a view from um, Bell Parkway in Brooklyn. And let me just make sure we're on the right slide. This slide just shows uh, why we have to de-energize stuff preemptively. So learning from Katrina, uh, Con Edison and many utilities put together these uh, uh, flood plans. And our plan included areas where we knew we had non-submersible equipment, and that's what's shown in the picture. This is a 460 volt installation. The switch carries several thousand amps. That's why it's not enclosed, because it cools better when it's not enclosed. And we didn't have an enclosed type of unit. These are typically in the basements of buildings. Sometimes they're in the street under the gratings that you're walking over. So salt water in there with, this, uh, with that 460 volts alive, you can imagine, doesn't go so well. So we had three networks, the Bowling Green Network in Fulton in Manhattan, and Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. Together, those three networks were about 34,000 customers that we preemptively shut down those networks, knowing that feeders with this type of equipment on them would trip out. If enough feeders trip out, it takes down the network anyway, so we do analysis to determine if, it's, if there's too many feeders involved. We further, dish, there were about 24 other feeders in uh, eight other networks that we shut down, but didn't have to take down the whole network. So customers didn't see that. The way the network system is, is designed, the network stays alive and there's feeders feeding into it. You can take a certain amount of them out of service without having an impact. Okay, now the next, the reason that photo shows all of southern Manhattan dark is that we have water coming in at the East 13th Street substation. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. Um, that affected 10, 11 other networks and they're, they're shown in red here. Those other networks all were um, de-energized, not intentionally. So uh, there's a relay house in, let me show you in this picture here, in the blue box area. I think I was off by one man. In the blue box area here, there was about three feet of water and there's relay houses in there. The relays are what tells the breaker, the circuit breaker, that it's time to trip because there's a problem on the feeder. Um, so that relay house got inundated with water, three feet of water. It saw all these problems and said, oh, we have faults. So it opened up um, breakers, de-energizing the other 11 networks. Uh, the photos I was showing is the green box in the top left. That's the area over there in the street where there was five feet of water. 
I think that's another photo in that street where there was five feet of water. This photo shows the relay connection cabinets. When you take the relays out, they were underwater and under salt water for only a matter of minutes during the high tide. That's not okay. No, and all of that had to be cleaned after the water was, was taken out of there. It had to be cleaned up. Luckily, we had some replacement relay equipment we were able to take out of our learning center. So some of the things that we're doing um, to, to harden the system, because we, we look at hardening components as a first resort here, um, and we're, we're installing advanced equipment, um, things like breakaway connectors, so when a tree comes down, it normally takes poles, wires, and everything with it. But if you can get some of the components, the wires, to break away, and in the bottom right hand corner we show a, a connection there for a breakaway service that goes into a house. This kind of works like a plug in the wall, you know, when you kick that plug it comes out. This way when the tree falls on it, it'll come down without taking the pole and even a part of the customer's standby with it. Um, makes it easier to restore later on too. We're looking at URD cables, underground residential distribution cables, putting them up in the air. These are direct buried cables normally in the ground, but if we put them up in the air, we add messenger cables. Um, that's actually a spacer cable in the bottom left-hand corner that you're looking at. There's a messenger on top, a steel messenger, so when the tree falls on it, it has a little bit more resilience. It also has a smaller footprint, so that branches coming down might, might miss it, and better insulation qualities. Um, sectionalizing equipment, the, the middle picture on the bottom is a sectionalizing switch, automatic switch. We're trying to uh, reduce the segment size and numbers of customers between automatic switches so that when there is a, an effect, it impacts less customers. Um, and enhanced technologies, we're looking at uh, distribution management systems. A lot of these automatic switches, you can communicate two-way with them. So you can incorporate them in a, into a, a management system that's moving, switch, closing and opening switches, moving loads to different pathways. Um, and it, it all involves uh, enhanced communications and enhanced uh, computer analytics and microgrids, which I'll talk a little bit to in a little while. Um, underground initiatives. We're looking at some of the latest technologies that we've implemented during smart grid operations or stimulus projects. Um, we, we've got underground sectionalizing switches. These are non-automatic switches, but we do have two-way control of those. And this picture that you should be seeing is uh, the development of subnetworks. So I've mentioned Bowling Green and Fulton. We'll still have to isolate those in, a, in another event, but we don't have to isolate the whole network if we put switches in the right place and we can coordinate those switches. So we've used these switches already in Smart Grid. We used them again on a stimulus project where we coordinated the actions of multiple switches. Now in this case, we're putting together advanced fiber optic communications to make it happen very quickly. Um, some of the other things we're putting walls in around that relay house obviously needs a wall around it and a pump to make sure that water doesn't get in there anymore. Um, other things we're doing to mitigate the impacts is uh, overhead sectionalizing switches, those automatic switches. We're putting about 4,100 switches in related to that and uh, uh, about 400 underground switches. And, and our, our focus now is to uh, harden everything to a, a FEMA. Uh, 1% chance of flood each year to a FEMA plus three feet. So anywhere where water would get in in that, in that uh, order. Okay. Um, this is one of those switches that I talked about earlier with an enclosed cabinet. So we built an enclosed cabinet. We had to deal with how to, to get the heat to, to be mitigated when, when several thousand amps are running through that, but we, we designed something that didn't exist before. This is a photo of the walls built around the relay house that I mentioned. Oh, this is, there we go. So you can see the red line is indicating where the floodwaters from Sandy came in. This is a pump. So obviously when you, when you build a wall, there's always a little bit of water that'll get through, so you gotta have pumps. It's part of a defense in depth strategy that we learned from the Dutch in a benchmarking effort. Um, just having a wall is not always uh, gonna solve all your problems. And uh, this is another item we designed to, for the control boxes that can be operated at ground level during normal operation and then raised during, a, during an event. And uh, I don't know how much further you want me to go into these other slides. Uh, I think that's fine for now. We can always bounce back. Okay. Bounce back.
But so now, um, what, what are the things going forward that, that are hardest? Um, and I think we all, us, us, us naive folks like me, think, well, why didn't they bury all these wires a long time ago? Those of us who don't live right in New York City and you know, live in the exurbs or suburbs. And I know, obviously, it's always about cost. And, and it looks like some of this breakaway technology might be a, sort of an intermediate solution. But in the, in the bouncing forward area, is there something that keeps you up at night that you feel is you would like to have happen from your standpoint as the engineer, uh, but that is hard? So what, what I think keeps me up most at night is, is uh, two factors. One is um, that the, it seems like the, the, the events are becoming more frequent and more severe. Um, so that's, that's really critical and important. We, we have a number of studies going on and we intend to revisit all of our standards and, our, and our, even our initiatives annually to make sure we're keeping up with what's, what's happening. I heard during the earlier discussion that the uh, coasts are sinking. I, that, that's, that was a new one. I didn't know that. Um, so I, I think uh, that, coupled with the, the reliability and safety of the electric distribution system, are two things that keep me up at night. So what are the things we can do more? Um, there's, there's some discussion. I think we're going to see more discussion of microgrids and distributed energy resources. I think that's a really valuable uh, opportunity for the for the utility industry, the electric utility industry, um, from the resiliency play for the, both the customer and the utility, and also from the opportunity to defer electric infrastructure. And Con Edison has a filing for uh, a portion of Brooklyn and Queens uh, that's uh, filed with the commission right now to do just that, to try and leverage customer side of solutions. So that's a good segue to Tom. So Tom Bridgewell, well, you've been working a lot on this question of microgrids. Um, and even with some of my students in the environmental policy program, uh, working with the village of Ossining on trying to develop for them the capacity to have more power generated there. And can you just give us a briefing on, on what microgrid even means? Like, what is that? And then we can talk a bit more about the Sandy context too. Yeah, um, are my slides available? Or? Hopefully they're, <laughs> they're, they're queued up, yeah. Uh, If we're waiting, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, thanks, Andy. Uh, um, a microgrid is uh, essentially a, a set of uh, loads that are interconnected, and they run uh, load by loads. I mean, like buildings, neighborhoods, a, a building, a block, a neighborhood, physically proximate. Uh, a hospital next to a NYCHA facility, next to a commercial office building, next to multifamily, what, whatever, um, that are uh, in close proximity, that have their own source of power, that can work, um, operate uh, independently when the grid goes down and operate in parallel with the utility when the utility is operating. Um, I'm gonna run through fairly quickly some of these uh, slides, but they will be available. And I asked, the reason I asked to put up some of these slides is just to give a little context. Um, in 2009, 2010, PACE was working with uh, New York um, CMO, State Office of Emergency Management, um, part of New York State Department of Homeland Security. And uh, we, were, we were working on this issue of uh, critical infrastructure resiliency. At one of our regional meetings with the uh, county emergency management staff, a top director at CMO uh, said, I don't know what CHP is, he says, but the most important thing to me in recovery is access to power. So he said, whether it's CHP or uh, hamsters turning a wheel in a cage, he said, that's, that's what I want. So um, one of my assumptions was, you, uh, some folks in the room may not know what, we, what I was talking about when I talked about CHP, so I did bring a couple of slides um, to, just to, to uh, explain. Uh, what it is, it's an integrated system. It's really um, using power at the, at the point of demand and recovering the waste heat in some productive manner for hot water, space heating, uh, absorption, cooling, so you can heat, cool, and power at your building with your own uh, generator. And as, as I was saying, CHP is used at the point of demand. It's not um, an esoteric, unknown technology. It's been around forever. Uh, 
the first electric power systems. Thomas Edison was a, was a, a, a district energy system utilizing CHP. So um, again, this is, this is something we like to say it's tested, proven, economic, reliable, and clean. Um, CHP benefits is improved fuel efficiency and reduced emissions, energy cost savings, energy security, and as uh, Troy was mentioning, also great congestion relief. If it's used in the right places, it can help solve congestion problems and um, alleviate some utility investment. Um, as I was saying, it saves money, it provides for greater efficiency, and following Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Irene and the October 2011 uh, snowstorm, it really, I think this really galvanized an interest. And again, this is not a panacea, this is uh, one component, one piece of the story. Troy, la Troy laid out a lot of the other pieces, but in terms of resiliency, this is, again, not a panacea, but a part of the solution. And policymakers and state leaders uh, uh, are, began to look towards this after both Sandy and the October um, and the 2011 events. Um, I'm going to, again, in the hopes of, uh, oh, this is not moving. There. Okay. I am going to spend a minute on the reliability benefits. Uh, CHP systems are designed to provide continuous electric and thermal power for a site, and when, and when designed to operate independent from the grid, as we were saying, uh, in this mode where they can isolate and operate independently when the grid is down or operate parallel to the utility when the utility is up, it can meet specific reliability needs and address various risk profiles for different customers. Uh, again, I, I want to underscore that uh, we're talking about I don't know I'm having so much trouble with this. Yeah, we're talking about uh, appropriately designed and configured and operated CHP. Um, it, you know, not all CHP is designed to operate in this way, but uh, uh, increasingly people are looking to do so. Um, I'll skip that one on operational requirements, but again, you do have to make an additional investment. And one of the points I'd like to make is that you know, these investments uh, are made by, pri by private um, entities, but it, they have social consequences. So if you, if you, make, if you build and operate a, a one of these systems, you are providing a social benefit during an emergency event, but you can't really recoup that unless you have a high priority in your business on, on um, like data centers, on high reliability. So there is so, some social imperative here as well. Um, is there a way to build policy so that there's some way well, for them to be compensated by that? Don't worry so much about that. Well, that's what I'm about, that's what I was ho hoping to hit. Okay. okay, yeah, here we go. Um, that's, that was my next topic. So, as a consequence of the social benefit, um, there has been a real emergence of re resiliency as a policy priority. And um, the, um, what is it? Here we go. Um, this area, the, the Northeast, is really uh, the epicenter of interest in uh, microgrids and CHP as a resiliency strategy. So to an answer your question, Andy, yes, the answer is that you, people are responding. In Connecticut, following the two storms that hit Connecticut, Hurricane Irene and the October 2011 snowstorm, the governor uh, impaneled the two storms commission. And one of the results of that was um, a call to provide community microgrids. These are microgrids that are um, developed by communities to house critical infrastructure, police, emergency fire operations centers, hospitals, um, senior centers, uh, warming centers or cooling centers or so-called centers of refuge. And Connecticut invested 30 million in that um, in, in 2014. Governor Cuomo established New York Prize, $40 million for New York Prize in his January 2014 State of the State. Governor Malloy, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> Governor Patrick in uh, Massachusetts, uh, only a week after Governor Cuomo, uh, he announced 40 million in Massachusetts and New, and New Jersey has a, a resiliency bank. So as you can see, these four states where we are right here are really the epicenter we've committed in 2014 alone, more than $150 million for the development of these community resilient microgrids. Uh, so that was the, the takeaway point that I wanted to leave there. And finally, if I can 
Yeah. We seem to just leave it here and it works. But... Yeah, that's fine. Just give my head Oh, hit it twice. Yeah. Okay. Brazilian PowerPoint. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I just want to leave with two examples. Uh, we heard that Lower Manhattan was out of well, out of power, but uh, one of these cases, the Brevoort, um, they have uh, four 100 kWCHP units. Uh, the normal occupancy it is 720 people, but during Sandy, the Brevoort was able to provide housing and power for 1,500 people. Uh, the uh, residents said, you know, come stay at stay at our place, sleep on the couch. You know, we have uh, uh, we can take you in. And uh, great quote here, powered by our CHP system, we were the only building on Lower Fifth Avenue able to provide energy and full service to all our, our residents. And uh, again, an, another example, just there, there are plenty of these. NYU is an example, but uh, here in Connecticut, uh, Fairfield University, it served as a, uh, a refuge center for the whole community. Um, other examples on Long Island, uh, South Oaks Hospital did the same. They took in patients, it's a hospital nursing home, they took in patients from elsewhere, they uh, allowed the community to come in, uh, charge cell phones, uh, refrigerate medicines, and so on. And uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over back to Andy. That's great. Um, one thing I, w I was hoping you could dive into a little bit more is um, I, the power that is generated in a distributed way has to come from somewhere as well. And in a lot of these cases, it's natural gas, right? Yes. So, so in other words, the natural gas system is a parallel grid. Mm -hmm. You need to have the gas there as well. Is that well understood by communities? Well, uh, yeah, I think it is well understood. And the um, one of the questions that we've looked at is, what is the uh, resiliency of the of the natural gas system relative to the electric system? And it's it's quite a bit more resilient. The uh, natural gas system is far less interrupted than is the uh, the electric system, but were it to be interrupted, if you wouldn't, weren't able to get gas, then these, uh, you know, these, these gas-powered systems would not operate. But when we're talking about microgrids, we're really talking about a portfolio of resources that includes other forms of distributed energy, including solar, solar energy, battery uh, storage, um, other types of, of, of uh, renewable energy. And uh, one of the problems um, with the solar energy is that uh, as much as we had in the state, none of it was operating during Sandy because it's designed not to when the grid is down. And so I know Troy is working on that and one, that's one of the issues we're gonna address is how do we make the distribution system more amenable uh, to allow for more amenability for distributed energy resources to allow them to operate uh, in synchronicity more so than they do today. Great, we'll circle back to that um, in a few minutes. So you can discuss. Um, Chris, uh, from the standpoint of a communication company, essentially, uh, that uses a lot of energy, that has, uh, but also, I guess, you do some some local generation, too. You, you have the capacity, is that right? So could you, from your standpoint, sort of fill in, here we are two years after this event, um, what do you think has and hasn't been done that matters to your business? So just to, to pick up from the maps and pictures that Troy showed before, because it really would be a, a similar graphic display uh, for me in walking through the impact to Verizon and its network, particularly here in lower Manhattan. So uh, one contextual item is that uh, in the fourth quarter of 2012, uh, Verizon took a billion dollar expense charge to its business to fix uh, and repair the network issues associated with uh, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, that was the largest uh, single uh, destructive incident in the plus 100 years of Verizon and its predecessor company's history. So this, this was the biggest, baddest problem that we had to deal with, even particularly here in lower Manhattan, uh, when we compare it to the events uh, of 9-11 and the communication uh, interruptions that we experienced here. And it's because of the distributed, the wide distributed nature of the storm that it made it a, a bigger happening and more destructive happening for us. But again, to, to pick up from the power uh, story there, as Troy pointed out, uh, knowing the storm's uh, coming timing and uh, expectations of the event, uh, the grid in lower Manhattan was powered down. Now, when situations like that happen, we are in close communication with Con Edison and we will turn our major switching centers onto alternative uh, backup power systems. In some cases, they are battery systems, which are used in immediate failover sequencing, uh, but they are largely diesel-generated uh, powered engines, uh, which we 
uh, worked with Con Edison on the timing of that and to turn those on. What happened in the aftermath of the storm during the storm's uh, destructive happenings is uh, the diesel uh, pumps and the diesel system to the engines was interrupted. Uh, in the case of our two, one of our two major network buildings at 140 West Street, the pumping system itself uh, was uh, interrupted and disengaged from the flood waters. In the case of our major network center at the southern tip of Manhattan, 104 Broad Street, the actual diesel tank was ruptured uh, from the velocity and the uh, hydrostatic pressure of the storm waters. So uh, more importantly, what, what have we done since then? What have we learned uh, from the incident? Uh, we have learned about hardening flood barriers in a more formidable way. Uh, so we worked uh, with uh, the Arcadia Company as well as with the City of New York uh, in establishing an uh, improved uh, flood barrier system. Uh, but as Troy commented, uh, you have to be prepared that your flood barrier system does not keep out all water. You can't assume that that is your only protection. Uh, but we've certainly upgraded the design of that to be able to deal with large volumes of water as well as high velocity of, uh, of the water that we experienced during Sandy. We have hardened the alternative uh, backup power generating systems in place. So we've upgraded them to what would be described as marine or almost submarine capabilities. So if flood waters did actually uh, get in past or improved barrier systems, uh, we have hardened those tanks in such a way uh, to prevent to keep water out. Uh, we have virtually built a submarine-like uh, structure around uh, the tanks and around those pumping systems. We've changed uh, the design of the pathway of all the piping systems so that they all run vertically instead of having any horizontal uh, turns or design in them, again, to reduce the hydrostatic uh, pressure um, susceptibility that such a design would have. We have uh, invested in hardening the very foundation of the building, so if there is any uh, structural damage to the foundation during uh, new flood water that there would be protection further protections uh, in the foundation to keep uh, those systems running because these the diesel tanks uh, have to be at the lowest sub basement of the building by building code law uh, so we have to be able to deal with where these things need to be for a safety reason but we need to be able to manage them through such incidents so they can continue to supply the necessary power to keep the communication systems running. When we talk about this distribution system itself, similar to conversations uh, that Troy touched on, uh, what we had uh, on the day of the storm is we had, uh, in the simplest of terms, is two wired networks. We had a fiber optic based wired network and a copper based wired network and we had services that straddled both of these networks. The copper based system here in Lower Manhattan and in many other parts of the Verizon Wireline system was irreparably damaged. It suffered faults at its origination point, it suffered faults throughout its distribution, and in many cases, particularly here in Lower Manhattan, not only did our buildings flood, but our customers' buildings flooded as well. So again, irreparable damage uh, to the copper-based systems. The fiber optic-based systems, however, um, went through the storm without incident. We did not have to replace any piece of fiber optic-based inf in infrastructure due to of intrusion of flood waters. What we did have to do, however, with the fiber optic based systems as we flushed them out uh, to be uh, more substantive as far as their reach uh, throughout all of lower Manhattan and migrating service over in the process is we had to work with building owners to take the interconnection points of the infrastructure that's put on the end of fiber optics and raise that out of the flood zone. So on the Verizon side at our aggregation point, we've established more formidable barrier systems, we've hardened the alternative fuel in place, and we've raised critical electrical infrastructure above floodplains. And then we've worked with customers to migrate services over to fiber optic based systems and move again those critical interconnect handoffs at their locations up and out of the floodplains. And so we sit here two years later and recognize that we are in a much, much better place uh, should a storm of of any nature like that uh, happen again, that we believe that we will come through it uh, much stronger. We already see in the conclusion of this upgrade that uh, the area of Lower Manhattan is actually the finest example in the Verizon Wireline Network of service quality. We are like the Maytag repairman down here, which is a good thing. It's a good thing for, for our customers. 
Similar in you know southeastern Brooklyn and south uh, south uh, eastern and western parts of Queens, uh, in the Belt Harbor um, Breezy Point uh, area of, of Queens, we've actually just finished cutting over that uh, complete area to fiber optic based systems, and we'll continue to work uh, on the other uh, southern coast uh, areas that were severely damaged to bring them to this end state to this complete fiber optic. Uh, base state hardening, again, doing the same hardening of uh, critical infrastructure in place to, to help it be more resilient through such storms. The, the other uh, positive thing at a full end state that we've been talking about with Con Edison is, is that at con the, fur the continuation of this, we will actually use less energy in total. Uh, we will actually, the, you know, in many cases throughout the city of New York, Verizon is one of the heaviest uh, demanders for power and uses of power on the Con Edison grid. Over time, as we make these upgrades to more modern and more efficient infrastructure, we, were, we are actually lessening our demand on the grid, which is helpful to Con Ed's planning and, and a better uh, use of energy on Verizon's part. Before we move to Oscar, uh, one quick question about a lot of what you just described was sort of the physical response, you know, the physical systems that failed and how you fixed them. Did, the, did Verizon, you must have done a kind of post-game assessment of the, the sort of corporate culture and or planning response? In other words, clearly no one anticipated this. Yeah, I wouldn't say we did. Just, just to give you, in 1821, I wrote about this storm that happened in 1821. I mean, this was an inevitability, right. and obviously it's a rare calamity, and that gets to the question of how much you invest for, for the rare thing, but how much of what you described Required, resulted in Verizon re-examining its own, the way it plans for the future. Yeah, well, I certainly wouldn't suggest we didn't plan for this. We uh, had uh, every understanding that the storm was coming and that it was going to be a storm like we had not seen before. Um, and, but what happens here is the amount of infrastructure that got replaced and the level of coordination. In six months' time, we did 20 years' worth of work. Um, so it's... Uh, it's easy to say in hindsight that uh, you know certain things could have been done here or there, but uh, um, the distribution of the issues, the fact that it wasn't just the Verizon infrastructure damage, that it, the Verizon location was damaged throughout the distribution system, trying to protect it uh, across every perceivable uh, fault opportunity is nearly impossible without having gone through this transformation without having gone through and, and moved all the services over in that time. And to say, well, why didn't you do that to begin with? There's a lot of market issues, regulatory issues um, that we're actually working with and actually taking the positive side of uh, what's happened here to actually drive those things forward faster as, as we go into the future. And that's where I'm hoping we'll close out, was, is like where are the, regu where are the opportunities in regu regulation and, and customer relationships in, that can build a more resilient uh, future for, for these systems? Uh, well, I would say, yeah, the, the, for, for us, that you know, those are, have already happened. I mean, we've uh, worked very closely with Conness and we're working closely with the city of New York of uh, how to uh, speed up anything uh, that remains for us to do as we go forward. So that's what we'll continue to do. So speaking of the city, so Osgam, you spent a lot of your time, you, you manage citywide utility accounts, implement, implementing build, uh, building energy efficiency conservation programs. So it's, you're look, clearly looking at energy systems as a system, which is a pretty unusual thing in America. We don't like, we don't do a lot of systems thinking. So, so just... Uh, I'm an engineer, so I look at things uh, from a systems point all the time. Um, what we do at the Citywide Administrative Services is um, two-pronged, actually. Um, the city uh, is a customer, obviously, buys a, buys a lot of electricity, gas, steam, um, and we have a buying power to make some changes. And on the other hand, we're also an investor in making um, our buildings more resilient from energy perspective and also diversifying our uh, supply systems um, through CHP or uh, through uh, solar installations. Just recently, um, Mayor de Blasio announced 24 schools um, getting uh, solar panels, uh, which will be 6.2 megawatts, maybe not big, but it's a good start. There's uh, about 19, 20 buildings that, city buildings that already have solar panels installed. and 
we're looking into 100 megawatts going into the future. And we're going to do that through a variety of different ways. We're going to um, do some capital investments. We're going to look for power purchase agreements. Some of our um, looking different contractual um, innovations to get there faster, as fast as we can possibly get there. Um, the other big announcement was uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050, and the city will lead that by reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 35% by 2025, which also gives us an opportunity to invest in our building in buildings infrastructure uh, to reduce our demand on um, energy and to relieve Con Ed um, and to make sure their systems are um, not working at their maximum capacity, but we have enough room um, to grow. Um, and also, I have to say that City has been working very closely with, like uh, you mentioned, with Verizon and uh, Con Ed to make sure they upgrade their systems so we're up to speed when something like this happens again. But not only on the energy side, but also on the infrastructure side um, and on the um, critical uh, coastal areas where we um, also are building more resilient structures and um, supporting our system so make sure that we don't get the uh, uh, flooded in the first place if we can. Um, the other important part I have to um, make sure we, uh, we work together is that um, on the CHP perspective and on the solar perspective, um, interconnecting and uh, making sure all these systems are available when uh, situation like Sandy happens again is critical. Like you mentioned, we solar systems were not available even though we had them in some of the schools. Um, we couldn't use them during Sandy. We want to make sure we back that up either with battery storage um, or we work with um, innovative contractual abilities with Con Ed to be able to be online um, and be able to support um, basic lighting or heating systems um, during that time. And one thing to say on the CHP plants, you did mention the uh, natural gas being the primary, but also most of these plants are dual fuel, uh, which could use um, ultra low sulfur diesel, uh, which is a backup, so if you lose gas, at least you have another day or so um, of, uh, of backup, which was the case at NYU. Um, and I think that will be that will be the case. You have a backup and diversify as much as possible um, our where our energy comes from, so that we are prepared and we're backed up, but in a very smart way. So it's very important that Con Ed um, and us and Verizon we all work together so that we can deploy the resources in the right place in the right time and be able to back each other up. So it's not, um, we're not, city is not going into the generation business, but uh, we want to make sure um, we have our critical systems back up as much as possible. One uh, CHP plant coming online soon is going to be on Rikers Island. Uh, about 15 megawatts of um, energy will be coming up. It will be taking care of most of the Rikers Island and also um, it will be supporting um, the laundry facilities, cooling, heating, all of that, and that will be. Um, it's, it's a very efficient system. One thing about the CHP plants um, is that you have to make sure you have 24-hour um, demand on them, whether through, uh, through the uh, electricity part or the high temperature hot water that comes out of it. So it has to be a mixed-use system. So you can't just have a CHP plant um, for an office building or um, for a residential building. It, the use has to be um, mixed, so it has to be a combination of um, office, um, residential, school, commercial. Uh, that makes the CHP plant very usable um, for um, and continued demand and very effective. Uh, hospitals are great because they're 24 hours, um, so we do have some capabilities uh, on the hospitals. But what are some of the other opportunities that we have um, where we can pull some of the resources together and uh, create more distri distributed district generation uh, to help the uh, distribution better? So, well, this has been a great initial uh, discussion. Uh, try to get your questions ready if you're going to come to the microphone or um, uh, by Twitter, Pace U Re Resilience. Um, one last, I just want to circle back to this, this issue of policy. Uh, maybe. Troy and Tom, if you can help identify if there were one or two initiatives that you could see 
facilitating the incorporation of CHP more into the grid that we, as we have it now, what would they be? Are they, at what level? Are they city, federal? You know, what do you do? This is the what do you do part. Um, fortunately, I think, I think we have that dialogue going on with the uh, uh, reforming the energy vision. In New York, there's a, a proceeding going on that's fundamentally looking at the utility industry and asking some of the questions that you just asked, Andy. How do you, how do you maximize the use of distributed energy resources on the grid? How do you send the signals to get the, those resources to the right places, you know, where they have the greatest value? And how do you get investments in the, in the distribution system that really allow you to make um, CHP and other distributed energy uh, dynamic assets that support the grid? Um, we don't have those incentives right now. So I think, in answer to your question, that hopefully as this uh, REV proceeding, and this is looked at nationally, even internationally, um, the, the New York PSC chairwoman has been interviewed uh, um, on NPR and elsewhere. This is really an innovative effort that says, uh, how do we kind of unbundle and look at the, the, the uh, fundamental utility business model and make this model more appropriate uh, and beneficial for utilities to fully utilize distributed energy to utilize it in the most productive way possible, including CHP. You know, paying it for value where it creates value, maybe charging it for cost where it creates cost, but just changing the signals. Um, I think this thoroughgoing review, if it, if it does what people are anticipating, will really help to launch um, not just CHP, but uh, PV, storage, and other uh, distributed assets, making the grid far more resilient and microgrids in the long run. And, and Troy, actually, just to add to, to, to the question, I assume this capacity would also benefit the city in heat waves, for example, that kind of thing? Uh, definitely. So, so, so uh, just to add to the, uh, to the answer uh, from Tom, there's a lot of collaborative efforts going, uh, ongoing right now. That's been a really beneficial uh, discussion. Um, CHP, are, for the most part, have been big machines where you have thermal load. Uh, which means the, the efficiencies are really far superior to anything else uh, around. So it's a great idea to, to implement CHP. Um, but the, there's costly, and because it's base load, it's usually going to be running in parallel with the electric distribution system. So there are complications with that, right? Uh, technical complications. There are automatic devices that are intended to prevent uh, flow from coming back onto the grid. So we're, we're trying to work through all those things. Uh, there are also incentives in place to try and uh, to, to alleviate some of those, uh, those cost constraints. Um, and, and I think we, we've done some CHP. There's about 150 megawatts currently on the Connexus system, CHP systems. And I think there's about 75 more in the hopper applications that are pending. So I, I think we're making progress there. So are there questions out there, the actual people who could come to the microphone? If you have them. Ah. Come forward. Thank you very much. You have a one second, about I think the costs of all these. And so I'm working in countries where not everybody has access to electricity and communication. So if, if you make the investments more expensive, basically you can cover fewer people and it takes more time to cover everybody. So it's really important for us to know the additional cost of this resilience uh, investments. So what would be your estimate? Doing something much more resilient, does it cost like 5% more, 10% more, or it's, is it a huge additional investment? Do you have orders of magnitude? Uh, it, it really, it depends on the site. Um, the, invest, the investment in, in this resiliency uh, can be, a, a, and actually what we're, we're working on a, a fact sheet on that right now with the US Department of Energy, um, it, it depends a lot on the, on the configuration at the site. It can be a, a, a modest cost or it could be a very significant cost. So these, these are really site uh, dependent. But the, the answer to the question is yes, uh, the resiliency does come at a cost. Um, there is a price for it. it there's an additional you know, um, uh, price tag. But on the other hand, you do want to be able to keep the hospital running. Uh, you don't want to have to transfer patients down 10, 15 flights of stairs and out. Um, you want to keep vulnerable populations in place. You don't want to have to evacuate the nursing homes. Um, 
So there, you know, there's an offsetting uh, benefit. There's a cost-benefit ratio to be looked at here, and and we believe that in the right, you know, in, in many instances, and once again, I I think I caveated this that it's not the panacea. It is one one component. It's part part of an answer, uh, but in the right circumstances, we think that added uh, social cost for warning centers, for centers of refuge, for keeping vulnerable populations in place, and for keeping critical services like hospitals, wastewater treatment plant police and fire emergency operation centers, we think it may be worth it. I just want to comment a little bit on the, the cost because in, in some cases, in the right applications, it may cost less. Um, so we've had a lot of discussions about how you can draw value from the grid. So if, if the grid, we have a steadily increasing uh, load profile every year, there's more customers and more devices connected to the grid, the, the, the demand for load increase every year. So some of these applications, particularly base load CHP applications, even emergency generation operating in a demand response mode, so they cut their load during peak periods during the summer, have some value. And if we value things properly, we may find some projects that, that make sense to, to do and at a less, less cost. I, I, would, I would echo that from a communication investment that the uh, benefits to be gained, if it, not even simply just talking about being prepared for uh, major incidents just on a day-to-day -day basis uh, more modern equipment is much more uh, efficient to utilize as I mentioned before from a uh, cost of power consumption but it also provides a higher quality of service in the interim so a lot less maintenance costs and it provides a future uh, proof uh, platform for services uh, that customers uh, will require into the future so the cost benefit is, is uh, positive on a number of points from my perspective so there's a, another question. This, this came in for Osgum, but I think Tom might want to weigh in briefly on it too. Uh, can you elaborate on why CHP has to be a mixed use system to be effective? It, it seems to be that it has to be a 24 seven demand. Uh, like I would love to have one for my house, you know, a CHP <laughs> system, but that's not possible. Um, I'll take a first crack at it and then you can support me from there. Um, so basically the, the reason the CHP system is very effective is because you, the generated, there's electricity generation, and then there's waste heat from that, from the turbines. And that actually gets captured to be, uh, to create either steam or high temperature hot water to be circulated for uh, heating in the winter, and then you can run them through absorption chillers for chilling in the summertime. So if, let's say, your demand is um, 10 megawatts in the afternoon, and then five megawatts in the morning, um, you, you can't keep switching on and off because you actually have to, there's, there's byproducts like high temperature hot water that's actually generated from that system. So that needs to go somewhere. The thing that makes it very effective is that you don't, you use the same amount of gas as much as possible. So in a regular, let's say, power plant, um, your efficiency is 30% or 35%, you can correct me there. With the CHP is 78% because, or 80% in some cases, where you actually keep using the waste heat or um, wasted uh, energy to do other things. But you need to create demand for those other things. So if you're just doing it for your house, you're not in the house, why are you going to be uh, heating the house or cooling the house where you're you're not there, um, you will be, again, self-wasting that energy. So in order to make sure that we actually don't waste anything is we have mixed use. So there's always a demand for that energy for the office buildings during the day, and then that shifts to residential in the, in the evening. And then if there's a hospital or um, another critical care facility that's open at night, so you, you want to keep that plant operating at its highest efficiency throughout the day and make sure you have uh, places for that electricity and high temperature hot water to go. So. Um, I will add just a little bit of a twist to that and I think what I'd like to say is that there's a continuum of applications I think from excellent to moderate to not uh, to don't even think about it. There's you know a number of economic sectors we don't even think about CHP. Uh, some are excellent like hospitals. but. Um, and, and hours of operation is important. Um, uh, as Ozjem was saying, you need to have a simultaneous need for electricity and need the thermal energy at the same time. But you don't have to size to your maximum load. And, and also, um, and, and I think Troy said that, that a lot of the CHP does not carry your entire load. It, it's base load. It's much less than that. 
And it, the economics um, are driven by hours of operation, but it doesn't have to be 87, 60 hours. It doesn't have to be all the hours of the year. It can be profitable at 3,500 hours half the year. Um, it, in, in part, though, it depends on what your energy prices are. If you're offsetting very high-priced electricity, um, it can be a very profitable venture even at half of the hours per year. One final point, though. Um, what Ozgem did say that I, I really resonates with me, and we have this pace put together, this community microgrid guidebook, and this whole idea of complementary loads. If you do happen to have a multifamily building that sits next to a commercial office building, that's kind of the prototype. You know, one is used intensively during the daytime, the commercial office building. The multifamily is used uh, intensively at night, and they fit very nicely together. So that if they sit next to each other and you can combine them, you can make a particularly efficient, highly efficient and economic system. So there's one more question that came in um, remotely. Um, Con Ed is using breakaway cables for faster restoration after storms. Do you happen to know if PSEG it, it cares it, is doing this in New Jersey? And I'll say it's <laughs> Central Hudson too, where I live. In other words, is this becoming kind of more of a, a norm? So we've started using breakaway conductors. A uh, variety, I don't know exactly which utilities are doing it, but a variety of uh, utilities are doing pilot programs. Um, so I would I would say they probably are doing pilots, but uh, nobody's doing a, a complete overhaul yet, including us. We're, we're doing a thousand units. We're going to see how they work out during storms, if they are truly easier to plug back in after the storm. Okay. Now, so we're kind of at the end and getting ready for Mike Berkowitz's uh, talk. Uh, is there any final thought that lingers in your your minds as being? getting us toward a wider application of, of things that are essentially no-brainers from an engineering perspective? What comes to mind? Anything you want me to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so <coughs> I, Just pull I, the microphone a little closer. I think there's a couple of factors uh, I just want to point out. Uh, a lot of the distributed generation, distributed energy resources, and when we say energy resources, that's energy efficiency, demand response programs, as well as, as distributed generation. A lot of those models uh, rely on the electric grid uh, as backup. And I think that's a really important factor to think about earlier on that the, the backup issue came into play if the gas supply goes down. So I think the business models for the distributed energy resources, they, they rely very highly on the availability of the distribution system as backup. <coughs> the distribution system may look different, so there's a lot of, of change in the electric utility industry. But it's important that we take uh, incremental steps instead of looking to rev revolutionize the whole electric industry all in one shot, that we make sure we maintain the reliability, the safety, and make sure that most of those uh, other models don't work out if there's no backup from the electric system. Any quick thoughts, Tom? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I've, I've been doing this for almost 20 years and I think this is the most exciting time in the electric utility industry that I've ever seen because of innovation, new products, new new services, new potential applications, uh, new market players and in, in states like New York and California, um, a hard look at new business models. So I think um, there is there's great opportunity and as Troy was saying, we do have to, we, we, we're not going to um, uh, abandon the grid. <laughs> Uh, but we're just going to reform, I think, how the grid is being utilized, change, change. Uh, you know, it, the conception of ha having power just flow one way from a remote large generator to your house is going to change. And there's going to be a lot of interaction between your building, you know, your factory, your building, your home, and the grid. And in that interaction, and vehicles too, the transportation sector, the, the housing sector, the commercial sector, uh, these new investments that uh, the utility will be making, and maybe private investments as well, I think is going to unlock some great new value, some really exciting new opportunities for distributed energy resources, and I think it will serve to make the grid a much more efficient and resilient platform as well. Uh, for me, we're just uh, going to be keenly focused in working in close partnership with Con Edison and with the city on just continuing to throttle forward and harden infrastructure and continue to invest and improve infrastructure. We talked a lot about uh, things that happened uh, in the direct impacted areas of the storm, but we've got upgraded flood zones now that we have to study and look at and uh, throttle forward in those places uh, to make sure that we're better prepared in the future. It was also interesting to me that you said some of the things you had already worked on were cutting your energy use already. So there's that 
just seems like everything engaging with these systems seems to result in sort of win-win scenarios. <laughs> well. Yeah, it does. So how, does it, how does that relate to the city's goals? And thank you again, all of you, for coming. Sure, and it, it actually nicely wraps up with the uh, city's goals, where we're actually focus on, focusing on five different things. We're looking to do retrofits and um, efficiency upgrades to our buildings. We are installing solar panels, 100 megawatts. We are um, investing in clean generation, CHP or others. Uh, looking at new technologies, battery storage, and uh, smart grid, and many others, um, and looking to invest in those and working with the utilities to come there, and also really invest in, in our operations and maintenance and our people on the, uh, in the buildings, making sure that they are effectively managing those buildings and the energy systems, and that they are ready for whatever comes up on their, on their way. And one thing that I want to leave you with is that you can be part of the solution too. Um, some of the things that we do in the buildings, in, in, in large scale, you can do at home and reduce your demand and look at what you're consuming at home, um, which actually is part of our grid. We are all part of the same uh, ecosystem to see if you could reduce your demand on the, um, on the grid and be smart about it and uh, help us out. That's a great way to wrap things up. I just want to bring in one last thought that relates to the solar panels you're putting on schools. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote recently on Dot .earth about um, the, the High School of Energy and Technology in the Bronx is a school that part of their curriculum is the students go to the boiler room and they learn from the custodian how their school runs as a system, just like we've just been talking about our grid. And the more we can build this um, kind of conversation into how we learn, uh, the better off we'll all be too. So I'm hoping those solar panels are part of the curriculum. Yeah, actually quickly, um, before joining DCAS and I was at NYU, but before that, um, I was the director of sustainability for the Department of Education. And I helped start that school partially because we um, couldn't find uh, technicians that will actually work on our building management systems and we thought um, we and it's expensive we had the era money we couldn't spend it because there wasn't enough people out there to do the work so what we were looking for is actually getting more students interested and that's why we started high school of energy and technology so cool. and get them uh, to work on solar system building management system and so nicely wraps up actually. so I'll have to interview you for another piece <laughs> thank you very much uh, let's thank the panel for a great discussion Thank you. is Michael Berkowitz, President of 100 Resilient Cities, who will speak on the foundations, um, the Rockefeller Foundation's multi-year effort to build urban resilience <coughs> worldwide. He joined the Rockefeller Foundation in 2013 <coughs> to shape and oversee the 100 Resilient Cities Centennial Challenge. Previously, he worked at Deutsche Bank as Deputy Global Head of Operational Risk Management, where he oversaw the firm's operation risk capital planning efforts serving as a regulatory contract and connected the OR management efforts group-wide. Until 2005, he was Deputy Commissioner at the Office of Emergency Management in New York City, where he worked on major planning initiatives, including the NYC Coastal Storm, Biological Terrorism, and Transit Strike Contingency Plans. He also led an, innovate, and, sorry, he also led an initiative to create OEM's Public-Private Emergency Planning Initiative and its ready New York City Preparedness Campaign. Please join me in welcoming Michael Berkowitz. Maybe I can, maybe I can walk and talk a little bit. Um, so it's, it's great to be here in my, in my role here at, at, at 100 Resilient Cities. I'm privileged to go all over the world and, and talk about resilience. Um, and I spend really a lot of time on the road. And 
Uh, most of those, one, I apologize to the mayors for not speaking their local language, so that's one of the things. I, I'm constantly apologizing for not speaking Spanish or French or uh, Burmese or, or whatever, um, because we're in so many cities. Uh, and two, I have to warn everyone that I'm a New Yorker and I go really quickly and to raise their hand to slow me down. Um, and I'm glad to hear, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm back with my people. Uh, and uh, I don't have to do either of those things. Um, but I, I do want to go uh, relatively quickly uh, through uh, the presentation and, and save time for some questions. As you heard, um, I was intimately involved in, in, in coastal storm planning. Um, and even though I was, I was um, working for Deutsche Bank in London, uh, when uh, Sandy hit, uh, I, I still, uh, you know, really recognize many of the issues and the players and um, obviously Deutsche is, is downtown on, on 60 Wall so um, we had our own response but it was a different kind of uh, a different kind of response there so I'm gonna go quickly um, uh, please uh, uh, stop me uh, if, 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 if you don't understand I, I'd love to make this a more of a two-way um, kind of dialogue um, and, and I have two sort of sections of, uh, 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 of my talk today. One is going to be, I'm going to do a little bit something on the framework. Uh, so a framework for urban resilience and, and talk a little bit about how we're thinking about it. I have one case study in there, um, a New York case study, in fact, to, to go through and give you a sense of how we're thinking about urban resilience. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my program, 100 Resilient Cities, Rockefeller Foundation's $100 million commitment to build urban resilience worldwide um, and, and give you an update as to what it is, where the interventions are, what we see the impact, um, and, 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 and where we are with that um, uh, afterwards. So, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll do the two pieces and then, and then ultimately stop for hopefully some questions and, and discussion. So a little bit about my um, introduction to urban resilience. Um, uh, so, uh, you know that the world's uh, population is urbanizing. For the first time in 2013, more than 50% of the world's populations lived in cities. And the estimate is that by 2050, 75%, three out of every four people globally are going to live in, uh, uh, going to live in cities. And at the same time, those cities are more and more vulnerable, whether it's because of climate change, uh, whether it's because of an, an insufficient infrastructure, whether it's because um, new uh, groups and populations uh, living together um, in different ways that uh, it, you know causes unrest, unease, sectarian conflict, and tensions. For all those reasons, cities are more and more vulnerable. And so um, we began to think about um, uh, uh, about urban resilience at, at the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and, and, and the way we think about it is that we, we think of both uh, sudden shocks, acute events, but also chronic stresses uh, can lead to social, physical, and uh, 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 societal uh, breakdown and collapse. Um, and, and I think this is a point of emphasis that when we think about urban resilience, we're really thinking about it uh, starting at least at a very broad place. Um, it, it's the acute events that often, um, particularly in the field that I come from, emergency management, that we really think about. But we found it a useful starting place to think about not just um, the, the shocks like earthquakes, wildfires, terrorism, and so on, but also the chronic stresses, things like food, water, and energy shortage. And it's worth pointing out here that the one city in the U.S. that's almost been wiped off the face of the earth didn't happen because of Superstorm Sandy or the Northridge earthquake or um, Hurricane Katrina or 9-11. The one city that's almost gone is Detroit. And that was because it was dependent on a single industry that became uncompetitive and it was the chronic stress of that uncompetitiveness uh, that began to, to, to make Detroit almost disappear. And now I know I'm oversimplifying an incredibly co uh, complex um, uh, a story, but, but nevertheless, um, I think it's a useful place to start. And I'll tell some examples in, in a bit about how cities can look at what their stresses are and their shocks and find the intersections between the two, and really interventions can go across both of those, um, both of those areas. 
Um, and what we've been doing is thinking a little bit about um, evolutionary resilience. So it's not just that cities can bounce back. They have this, uh, you know, this, oops. It's not just that they have this um, trajectory of development and, 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 and you know, uh, experience a shock or a stress and bounce back, but in fact that they can change their path of development in some meaningful way to account for the new realities, whether that's um, uh, a new influx of immigrants, whether that's climate change, whether that's uh, a, a different kind of economy, and that resilient cities are really the ones that can understand, account for, um, and act in a way that, uh, that, that is mindful of that new reality. And so this is the working definition that we have, um, uh, and I know that resilient gets used in a lot of different ways, and so I thought it would be important just to sort of say it, that urban resilience is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, grow, uh, no matter what kind of chronic stresses um, and acute shocks they experience. So that's, that's uh, uh, the working definition. I would say it is, it continues to be a source of debate um, and uh, um, uh, discussion within the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, our boss, uh, uh, Judy Roden, who's the president, has a book you know, coming out called The Resilience Dividend in a couple of weeks, which I think will gently shape and nudge this uh, definition a little bit further. Um, and we heard a lot of talk about uh, 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 systems, um, and our uh, understanding is about the, um, you know, the ability of complex systems to, fit, uh, to function when faced uh, with disruptive circumstances, and that cities are really these sort of systems of systems. Um, and it's uh, both a, 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 an energy system and a social network and uh, a, a, a governance system and so on, all of which, uh, and I'll talk about this in a bit, all of which are important um, uh, to a city and, and, and key as part of its resilience. Um, and to give you a, the, just the first taste of that, uh, I'll tell you this story about the, this Toyota plant in Turkey. It was engineered to the highest level of seismic safety, um, uh, really to within an, an inch of its life. And this is after uh, a, a 7.6, uh, the Izmet earthquake. Um, and you can see, I mean, really the plant survived in great shape. Uh, it really performed to the specs that it, it, it did. And yet, um, in the surrounding cities and provinces um, is a much different story. You have uh, uh, roads, uh, hospitals, uh, there's uh, um, uh, you know, almost 20,000 people and 50, 000, uh, killed and 50,000 people injured. And the Toyota plant obviously went offline. It had no transportation, it had no employees, it had no supply lines, and so on. Um, and so part of the point of this uh, 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 case study is that resilient systems exhibit certain qualities. Um, not every, this, these qualities don't apply to all systems, but um, you begin to get a sense of, of, of what is a resilient system. Um, and uh, resilient systems are reflective and resourceful, so they have the ability to learn from the past and to act in certain ways. Uh, and then they organize themselves in certain ways that they're robust, redundant, and flexible. I think we heard a lot about that on the, on the previous panel. Uh, uh, about, uh, about how, how they're organized. And finally, that they're inclusive and integrated. Um, and, and in some ways, that's the, those are the qualities that were missing um, um, from the Toyota plant, that it didn't look at itself as an integrated entity with the surrounding provinces, towns, um, and country. Um, and, 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 so, uh, and, and, and so it really wasn't resilient at the end of the day. Um, and, and so that's at a high level what we think of as, as resilience, but let me talk a little bit more in, in concrete terms uh, about something we're calling the City Resilience Framework. Um, it was de developed um, in partnership with Eric, uh, the engineering and consulting firm, um, and ultimately it's going to lead to a City Resilience Index. But I'm, I'm going to talk more about the framework piece of it so you get a sense of what we think of as uh, city resilience or, 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 or urban resilience. Um, and we see it really holistically, having four dimensions around health and well-being, around economy and society, the infrastructure and environment. That's a place that many people go, particularly engineers, start from this place of infrastructure uh, and environment when we talk about uh, resilience and leadership and strategy. 
Um, and I don't, don't fret if you can't read all of those and make sense of this. I, I appreciate that this, is, um, uh, uh, that, th that this is complex. I'm gonna go over each quadrant. But to give you a sense, we have 12 uh, drivers of resilience. Um, you have, uh, three in each of the quadrants. Um, and they really speak to what cities do well and how those things contribute to a city being able to withstand shocks and stresses. Um, and, and I should say that when I talk about cities here, I'm not talking about municipal government necessarily. I'm talking about the ecosystem, the private sector, the public, um, uh, uh, civil society, all of the elements that go into making uh, cities what they are. So not necessarily municipal government here. Um, so the first quadrant is around uh, people. Uh, and it's how well cities meet basic needs. We, I heard, we heard a question uh, to the panel earlier about, about uh, cities in, in many places of the world that don't um, provide good food, water, energy to their citizens. Th those, the ability of cities to do that um, makes them uh, inherently more resilient. How well they support diverse livelihoods and employment, um, and how well they have, you know, what, what the state of their public health um, and emergency response system. So all of those elements um, make uh, uh, cities more resilient. On the second piece of that quadrant, economy and society, uh, the, to the extent that cities promote uh, cohesive and engaged communities, ensure so social stability, security and justice, and foster economic prosperity, all of those are elements of what makes cities more or less resilient. And for me, actually, this, um, uh, this, this bucket here around cohesive communities is one of the big differentiators. It's the, it's the thing that says to a city, um, you know, if, if you have in, in cohesive and engaged communities, those are, the, those are the cities where neighbors check on neighbors, where they can withstand the blackout or the occasional misstep by police or the earthquake. Those are the cities that have the ability to withstand what, what, what those, those next uh, steps are. And it's the cities that have low levels of cohesion uh, that are waiting uh, to, you know, to become tinderboxes uh, and to explode. Uh, and so for me, this is a huge differentiator. We talk, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, more about it in the case study. Infrastructure and the environment, the extent to which cities provide and, uh, and enhance natural and made, man-made um, um, uh, assets. So we're talking about the built environment as well as the natural environment. Quite often around the world, we see cities that have paved over wetlands, and when the rains come, there's nowhere for the water to go, they flood. Or the cities that have deforested um, uh, the, the mountainsides and the hillsides above the city, and so when the rains come, the, the landslides come. Uh, those are big uh, aspects of, of what makes a city resilient. Uh, that they ensure uh, continuity of critical services, I think this is a piece of what was, uh, was discussed on the prior panel, and that they provide reliable um, communication and mobility, both uh, the, uh, the, the transportation of both information and ideas as well as uh, people and goods. And finally, the last piece, how well do cities uh, have integrated leadership and strategy? How well do they have empowered stakeholders um, and, uh, you know, uh, and thought leadership? All of those elements I would argue to you are important when we start to think about what makes a city resilient. Um, so I'm gonna just take a quick breath and see if anyone has any, I, I've got a case study that I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this more tangible in one second. Any quick questions? Okay, so let me give you uh, the case study and, 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 and we have a number, but I, I picked uh, this New York case study for this audience. This is the tale of two blackouts, the 77 blackout and the 2003 blackout. And you think about what happened in 77, um, you know, good portions of the Bronx and Brooklyn burned uh, 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 for days and weeks afterwards and there was widespread civil unrest. In 2003, it was a much different story. Um, you had people uh, going orderly over the uh, Brooklyn Bridge Anytime you lose 10,000 traffic lights in your entire subway system in, in New York, it's never gonna be a great transportation uh, commute home, but 
um, uh, people uh, got on with it. Uh, I have many friends who say it was one of the you know, most romantic, best nights of their life uh, in, 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 in New York City. Um, and, you know, as much as I would like, I was running the city's emergency operations center that night, so um, it was, wasn't romantic for me. Uh, <laughs> and as much as I would like to take credit, you know, in terms of a public safety response, in terms of a emergency uh, operations response, really, when you think about where New York was in 1977, across that wheel, um, and, I've, and I've blown out one side of it, but let me, let me just go back to here. When you think about almost across every single one of these drivers where the city was, um, in terms of uh, businesses uh, leaving, in terms of uh, middle class flight to the, the suburbs, in terms of uh, you know, you had three police departments as opposed to one. Uh, the, you look at how we were treating, let's say, our, our, our natural assets and, and the waterfront, what the waterfront looked like in 77 versus what it looked like in 2003. All, along almost every single one of these indicators here, New York was in a worse place in, 2000, uh, in, in 1977 than it was in 2003. And that really accounts for the different kinds of responses. I would argue, actually, that 9-11, you know, you think about what happened in 2003, um, that 9-11, in some ways, we were still feeling this connectedness um, after uh, uh, the, the events of 9-11, and that caused us to react differently uh, than uh, in, in, in 2003 than we might have otherwise. We knew how to come together, we knew how to check on each other, how to bring water to the elderly who were trapped on upper floors, and so on. All of that made us a much more resilient city. Um, and so what we're, and I'll talk about the planning process in, that, that, that we're engaging with cities, but you can see a city beginning to look at itself across you know, all 12 of these drivers and say, where are we strong or weak? And what can we do to build resilience to exploit the places where we're strong or to mitigate the places where we're weak? And I like this because I, I, think, I, I like to think that, let's say, LA might have looked at itself in the late 80s, early 90s and saw you know, a city that had at least two different you know, uh, uh, communities, um, one that did not feel a part of you know, the overall success the city was having that had a lack of transportation, economic opportunity. And so whether LA would have been able to predict that the cops would have beat Rodney King and it would have gotten captured on film or not, they could have begun to, uh, you know, address what some of the weaknesses in the, in, in the city and in the city's resilience posture were if it had done, if it had done a, 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 a real assessment. Um, and so whether that was going to be a blackout or an earthquake or wildfires or Rodney King, LA didn't have to know what the spark was in order to understand where its vulnerabilities and its risks were. Um, and so that's why I sort of like uh, this as a, as a paradigm, as a framework for helping cities understand. Um, and I would say at the end of the planning process, so you, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a second, but you can see, you start at the beginning and say, where do we need to enhance? Well, you can also take interventions and assess them against this. Ass you know, so I, I'll give you one more New York example. I get to use all my New York examples. It's really great. Um, you think about Robert Moses proposing the Cross Bronx Expressway, uh, 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 the Cross Bronx, as a, um, a, a, as a resilience intervention. Um, and he might have said, Moses might have said, this will enhance reliable communications and mobility. But if you assessed the Cross Bronx against this wheel, you would have said, you know what, it has very bad implications for social stability, security, and justice and very bad implications for cohesive and engaged communities because it cuts the cross, it severs the South Bronx um, from the rest of the borough. And that may have argued against, if you had this framework when Moses had proposed the cross Bronx, that may have argued against 
uh, building that, we're doing it in a different kind of way. Um, and so that's the way in which we're going to use this framework. You saw a little bit about at the end here. Um, so if you see that's the economy and society quadrant, these are the three drivers. And actually, as you can imagine, there are sub indicators that then support those various aspects. And so we're ultimately going to be creating a uh, city resilience index that will help cities assess themselves um, and, and, and really understand where they are strong and weak. So there, I've finished the first bit of my um, presentation. I'm going to tell you quickly about 100 resilient cities. Um, but if there are questions or comments before I start there, yes. Um, the I don't know if everyone heard it, the question was, are there opposing points of view to the framework? Um, there are criticisms to the framework, and the criticisms, um, the, mo the most prevalent criticism that we've heard is about the lack of equity being an explicit piece of this. You can find it in many different places, and if you take the qualities that I talked about and the framework together, you can definitely get equity out of it. But it's not as explicit as people would like. So that's one of the ones that I've, I've really begun to hear. I would say the other aspect that, that unsettles people, although I feel pretty good about it, it not being here, is that there's no, there's no risk or ha there's no hazard calculation here. This is all about city's performance. And so Tokyo will look great here, even though it's you know, incredibly exposed to seismic and other kinds of hazards, um, and because they do a lot of this stuff really well. But what, what you don't see is that other, uh, the other side, which is the hazard side. And who is New York ranked out there? Well, so we haven't, we haven't done any rankings yet. Um, uh, we're just now creating um, we're just now creating the variables that we begin to measure against the sub-indicators. So we're a little ways off. The way we're working with cities right now is to have, to basically do qualitative assessments around it. Get multiple stakeholders in a room, a couple of different rooms, um, and really talk through where smart people who know their city see themselves as strong or weak. And for me, that, that's enough to act on. Um, uh, you know, but we will ultimately get, you know, um, uh, variables. I, I would say that even there are, um, and Eric, who's, who's ultimately designing it, the real purpose is to help decision makers take action, not necessarily to rank, but I think there are, if we're honest with ourselves, many different applications. If you want to fund, you know, um, resilience interventions, for instance, if you have a a, a standard metric that the market can react to and so on, I think this will be one of those things, but that's actually a few years off. Is, is any one area needed more than the other? Or are they all as equal? They, they are all as equal. So the question was, is any one area weighted more than the other, or are they all as equals? And right now they're all as equals, but one of the things as we're sort of fine tuning this beta version that I'm showing you, that's a big point of discussion, that maybe they shouldn't be, maybe they shouldn't be. <laughs> um, so uh, right now they are definitely all as, all as equals. Okay, let me quickly go through um, a little bit. Uh, so I, I said that um, 100 resilient cities, it was Rockefeller's $100 million commitment to build resilience in 100 cities worldwide. Um, uh, it was announced in 2013 on the, uh, you know, on the centennial anniversary of the foundation. So, you know, we fell in love with 100s, 100 million, 100 birthday, 100 city. Um, we chose 32 cities in uh, 2013. We're in the process of choosing another 32 cities, which will be announced um, in December uh, of this year. And in 2015, we'll choose the, the balance. This is the cohort of the first 32. You can see 10 um, in the US, including New York, um, uh, and then a, a smattering, uh, a diverse smattering across um, 
the other continents. What we tried to do is to have a city that every other city could see itself in. Um, and so we've got big cities like Mexico City and Bangkok and New York and LA, and we've got small like Ramallah and Ashkelon and Biblos, Lebanon and uh, Vale, Denmark, a city maybe some, even some Danes haven't heard of, um, and, and a balance of different kinds of hazards there. So you can see we've got Delta cities um, and, and ones that are vulnerable much more, to, you know, much more directly to climate change. We've got seismic, uh, we've got a couple of, a number of cities that see crime and violence, so or chronic stress, like Medellin as its primary challenge, uh, a really a, a diverse cohort. And yet we're beginning to you know, connect uh, those cities together and, and, and they have much more in common than they thought. You can just go to the next slide. Is someone up there with master control? You can just flip for me. No. Okay. So next slide, please. Okay. And so what we're we're set up to do is to uh, address really two fundamental problems that we see uh, with cities. One is that they are complex ecosystems, and you have a number of different. Um, stakeholders across a, a various levels of government and different sectors of society uh, and it's hard for cities to prioritize around the issues that they want to solve for uh, and the second is that um, the cities quite often don't effectively scale solutions so there's too much reinvention of, of, of what's going on and that comes at a very high cost um, that cities either because they think only things that are invented in New York will work in New York because there's too much um, choice, there's too little choice, for whatever reason, quite often don't implement um, a, a, a stuff that's out there that's available that they could do at much lower cost. And so trying to organize, on the one hand, the city, and the other hand, the market, is the thing that 100 Resilient Cities is set up to do. Next slide. Um, and you can see we have four um, different interventions. So we're going to help cities hire a chief resilience officer, uh, and for those of you in the private sector, you'll recognize it's a little like a chief risk officer, a CRO, um, uh, someone at, at the most senior levels in municipal government with the breadth and scope to look across the sectors and the silos uh, and advocate on resilience. If you think about the mayor as the CEO and the head of finance as the CFO and the deputy mayor for ops as the COO, this is the CRO. So trying to think about it in that way. Um, and we're going to help the city re develop a resilience strategy. So to go through an analytical process and to look at what the risks and hazards are, uh, what the opportunities are, and to ultimately come up with what priorities are for resilience building, what some initiatives are uh, to support those priorities. Uh, third, uh, this platform of services and resources. This is really a well-curated space that cities can draw upon uh, some of the best resources that are out there. And finally, a membership in a peer-to-peer -peer network. And if you see the first two are, are trying to address that first problem around uh, the complexity in cities, and the second two are trying to scale solutions and organize the marketplace for solutions in a better way. Next slide. Um, I think I talked en enough about uh, the chief resilience officer, but a senior uh, person to work across the sectors and the silos. Next. Next. Um, and this is what I was talking about, you know, uh, this planning process, a six to nine month process that looks at, you know, what key shocks and stresses are, so that's your hazard assessment, where the city lines up along the diagnostic, what the existing initiatives and priorities are, what could be some focus areas, how do we get to a gap analysis, and ultimately how do we get to solutions um, and, uh, and, and initiatives. Next. Here are some of the partners that we have already signed up. This is everything from technologists to technical assistants to funding opportunities to best practices, trying to better you know, figure out how to scale those things that are out there into cities and do it more efficiently. And so you can see we've got you know, uh, public sector, private sector. I know we heard from the World Bank earlier they run a credit worthiness academy to help cities improve their credit score. 
Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's a long-term process. This isn't a one-off. Uh, but for cities that ultimately want to access the capital markets to fund infrastructure investments and so on, um, one thing that they're going to need is, is not just, you know, a good credit score, but a credit score, uh, you know, a credit rating at, at, at all. Um, Swiss Re, Ushahidi, which is big data, and so on. So trying to figure out ways uh, to better uh, scale um, uh, solutions into cities. Next. Uh, and finally, the peer-to-peer -peer network. I mean, these CROs are really the first of their kind. As I mentioned, the private sector, CROs is a fairly common, um, a, a, a sort of a common position, but in, 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 in municipal government, uh, certainly not. So, you know, this peer-to-peer -peer network between CROs and ultimately cities is something we're beginning to stand up now. Next. And, and, and one last, so this is the last thought about uh, about 100 resilient cities um, is that if you think about each of these little uh, circles is with a little CRO in the middle connecting the different pieces and that's incredibly valuable you, you would be surprised at how many cities how many sophisticated cities we go to where the people who are working on climate and the people working on seismic and doing it in the same neighborhoods are meeting at our workshops for the first time um, and so that kind of connectivity um, is really important. And that's what that little, uh, this little thing is, is, is meant to be. But when you think about it, it's not just about one city, it's about a hundred cities. And being able to, if, we're, if we do this right, and this is still a big if because we're you know, one year into a, a long process, that if we're able to do it right, that we, are able to aggregate what the needs are across a hundred cities. That solid waste or power, you know, power resilience uh, issues are the same in Quito as they are in Ramallah, as they are in Da Nang, Vietnam. That we're able to see those connections and really communicate that uh, to the market. And at the same time, take what I was talking about, the market solutions through the platform and scale it more efficiently into the 100 cities. That's the virtuous cycle that we're trying to create. Um, and so at a, at a meta level, that's, that's, that's really what we're, uh, that, what, what we're aiming for. Uh, and so with that, I will stop. See if there are any other questions, either about the framework or about 100 resilient cities. Have you thought yet about what benchmarks of success would be for your program? It's a great question. So, for those of you who didn't hear it, it was well, have, have we thought about what benchmarks for success would look like? You, you're, it, it's uh, yes, um, we have. <laughs> it's it's absolutely not an easy thing because, in some ways, um, you know, you're talking about low frequency, high impact events, which are hard to manage. So ultimately, the benchmarks are better outcomes. But when you, how do you know that you've had better outcomes? Because you have very low frequency, high impact events, which are hard to measure, um, uh, in the shocks in particular. And that you're talking about very complex systems that only improve over long periods of time in a meaningful way. And so how do you do all that? So we ha are defining what some like, high level impact benchmarks are, but we're also figuring out what are some of the tactical things on the way there. So it'll be things like, do CROs get rehired uh, in their cities after our grant funding runs out at the end of two or three years? Do other neighboring cities who aren't part of our program at all see the value in having CROs and doing resilience planning and hire people themselves regardless of whether they win from us? It's those kind of things that we're tracking on the way up. Um, and so, um, yeah. It continues, in fact, I have a meeting today at five on, on this very thing, because Rockefeller, you know, if they're gonna give $100 million to someone, they gotta figure out <laughs> if they're getting their money's worth. <laughs> yes. Do you see an application for your framework at the community level in New York City? And I'm thinking specifically around chronic stress. Like, is there an application Yeah. It, it's a good question. There is, um, there's been a lot of conversation about that because this is at a city scale and what we're talking about is and really in my view the only way things actually change is at a subsidy scale and there are a few larger systems maybe like the power system that work at that large at the city scale but almost everything else 
is now at, at a more micro scale. And so this is really designed um, to look at the city scale. So it might not be appropriate. Some of the metrics will, but as a framework, um, it, will, it will really be um, only applicable at, a, at a, a larger scale. But there have been, I know, um, conversations about how to abridge it because there are a lot of people who have asked this question about how can we use this at, at a less, uh, at, at a more tangible level. Um, so. Good afternoon now, it's afternoon. Uh, I'm Joseph Ryan, I'm one of the people who helped this uh, event come to place. Uh, first of all, let me thank all of our guest speakers for being here today. The valuable time, Stefan, from uh, across the pond, as we like to call it. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for coming here, all our guests. Uh, just to quickly wrap up from an academic point of view, Osgam basically said she's an engineer, and she looks at things as a system. Well, we're in a university, we look at things from an interdisciplinary point of view. We have the social sciences, the evacuation of people, the healthcare issues that involve uh, for el elderly in the nursing homes. Then we have the natural sciences. Uh, I know where's Tom Bourgeois, he was talking about megawatts and you know gigawatts, and he's really excited. And I know some people were trying to figure out what are, they, what are they, but they don't get as excited as Tom does. But uh, it took a long time for us to put this conference together. I am, you know, we put a lot of effort into it. Uh, I remember in one of our early planning sessions, someone said, you know, uh, equivalent to what Michael was saying a few moments ago, you know, the first week of Sandy was, you know, kind of romantic. You have candle, uh, dinner by candlelight. Second week, I'm going to kill you because if I don't get a shower soon, this is not a joke anymore. So. There's a lot of inter interconnectedness behind everything. Uh, the social sciences deal with up, up things up front, and then you have all the scientists working on the big problems behind the scenes. So that's it for now. Thank you all for coming. I'll make just one more point. This is, a, this is our second summit. We want to have more in the future, two years down the line. We are going to look at, reach out to everyone. We're going to send you a follow-up. Any ideas you have for subcommittees, sub-ideas, sub-panel discussions before the next summit and in two more years. So thank you all for coming. Have a great day.